in avoidable that we some of our lectures may overlap a little bit, or we're talking about the same thing more or less, but perhaps from different perspectives. And I'm both psychologist or an archaeologist, basically psychologist. So I tend to look at uh, archaeology from the perspective of psychology and vice versa. I can uh, I can really uh, surprise my students by telling people by them by how people lived before and how people were thinking before and so on. Okay, so is there how this works. It works. This is a typical Norwegian. Here's my grandson walking towards the mountain here. He's two years old. And this is the Hallingskava mountain in the background. It's the longest mountain range in northern Europe. I had to put that in. And uh, he loves being out there. Now Hallingskava has a history. There, this is a professor on Ness. He was the one who term, uh, made the term um, eco-philosophy. Eco and uh, he lost his father when he was very little. And he has written a book that is called Hallingskala Mountain, the father of the good long life. Was he insane? No. He's another typical Norwegian. <laughs> because a lot of Norwegians have these feelings for the mountains. And good God, if somebody in my city of Bergen, if some politician said we must cut down that big tree, Oh, upheavals, like the Catalonia of, uh, of Rome. You know, people oh, don't cut that, that tree. But this kind of attitude to, to, to nature, I grew up with it. So I thought everybody was like that. Now I know that Norwegians are a little bit weird. And this is an explanation that we are maybe not that weird when it comes to it. Nina Witoszek, uh, she's a Polish philosopher and cultural historian. She has written a very thorough treatise about uh, Norwegian culture, where she, where she said it's characterized and soaked with deep and personal, what a lot of people we call animistic or anthroposophic attitudes and relationship with nature, and a profound rationality. It was a rationality that took uh, uh, Amundsen to, to, to the South Pole, right? That kind of you know, practical. I mean, if you're in an international airport and you see somebody with practical clothes and backpack, you know it's in the region, right? <laughs> because we are rational and, yeah, come to earth. And yes, she has shown it thoroughly through our literature from Edna, the ancient mythology, 2,000 years older to RNS, and also in art and so on. How can both be true? How can you be animistic and rational? As a psychologist, I say it's... It's very easy. Are they incompatible? No. Psychology on perception and connection, and uh, cognition has told me otherwise. I try to speak up. I hope I keep the time schedule. It's okay. I hope it's okay. No, but these people are sharp. They, they catch up with things. So psychological research on our perception and cognition has shown that the so-called animism and anthropomorphization are rational, considering the following neurological pro uh, phenomena. Poso uh, this is difficult to say. Posopagnosia, pareidolia, and gestalt formation that is connected to it, projection and personification, well-known psychological phenomena in normal beings. So to see figures, as the former speaker told us, he, he had students and other people, they saw a lot of figures in, in this stone, huh? an arbitrary stimulus. And some of you may know something about the psychological test called the Rorschach test, mm -hmm. where people see, you know, black, black, black. And, and people see things in, in the stimuli that, that really isn't not about anything. And there are some people who don't see anything. Guess who? The mentally retarded and the deeply re depressed. And, and those with borderline uh, psychological problems. So it's normal to see these things, and there are certain processes behind it that can explain why. The posopognosia is the inability to recognize faces. It's a new diagnosis. It's a very serious condition. If you can't tell your friends, your family, you can't even recognize your own face. You don't know who am I going to trust, rely on, talk to, work together with. Because face recognition is so essential to us. Now we can look at apes' faces and we can see, well, they are different, but good God, people's faces are more different than other species' faces. 
And that is because we recognize each other's identities basically on the basis of the face. So it's essential for our interaction and our adaptation. And this face recognition is also connected to the movement and creature recognition. We see gestalts. You don't have to see a, a whole tiger to know that's a tiger there. I mean, you can see the tail, you see, oh, it's a, it's the, or you can see some kind of pattern and you make a gestalt out of it as the former presenter showed. You don't have to have the whole thing. You, you kind of see the rest, you add the rest into a gestalt, a figure, a form. And this is also essential for human survival. And I'll show you some funny examples. So this is how our brains are wired. So this face recognition leads to pareidolia, the tendency to see faces in all kinds of things, because we are set on looking for faces, and also other figures for that sake. And we can see this in things both from nature and culture. Here are some examples from culture, right? You love, you see the faces, huh? Yeah, eyes, yeah. Nose, nose. Yes. eyes, nose, mouth. This is my car. This is my <laughs> car. Uh, this is my fireplace, which we call no problem. And here is also a very old and nice, a retired face. So you laugh because you see the faces. And here are some examples from nature. Some more examples that we, we saw earlier. Here is a little goblin, her eyes are And here is a smiley from a, a riverbank. Here is a, a little a monster, or shiva, or whatever. This makes me a troll with a big nose and a, a big laughing mouth. And we see these things. It's not because we are animistic or anything. It means that our brain are normal. And a larger version, as I said, was, uh, was gestalt formation, that we see figures, persons, animals, or strange creatures in arbitrary stimuli. Here are some, I could have shown you hundreds of pictures like this. Here is some kind of monster, right? Here is somebody showing the way when you ski, you point to the right direction. Uh, this may be a man with a beard, a long nose. This is a um, director for, for, uh, for an officer, perhaps. I don't know. I have it in my house because I, he keeps me company. And here are lots of uh, heads popping up out of the door. Could be spooky on a dark night. But you see them, right? Huh? Oh, yes. Yeah, you are mentally intact. <laughs> so. For human adaptation and survival, spotting possible animals, both as prey and predator, was and is still essential and very rational. Where is the animal here? There? 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 Some of you don't know. That is also a stone. <laughs> Sometimes they are not stones, and that is important if you're going to survive. These are easy to spot, huh? Also the little one running there. Where are the deer? How many see? How many deer do you see? Six. No. <laughs> Six. There are two. And you have to look for the, you know, the forms and add the rest. Because if you want to survive on hunting, this is important. And here is something going on. There is something in the grass that is not grass. Can you see it? You have to be a good spotter. I've been a safari in Africa. And I was told I was a good spotter. You have to spot for things. It's a, it actually was a fox. OK, these are amusing then. What is this? Friend of her? Animal? What is it? Uh -huh. It's a juniper bush. So don't waste your arrows on this one. And don't be afraid. So, so far, seriously, pareidolia and gestalt formation are very important. Now something on projection and personification. The former speaker told us about that. We tend to project our tendency. Yeah, <laughs> this question. And how many of you have not talked to your car? Oh, or your computer? Huh? Or to whatever, the door or that didn't open or whatever. We do that. Why is that? Because what I am, I think others are. Other people, animals and things. It's hard for us to really imagine that things do not have some kind of soul, an inner life. 
a little children do the same thing. Oh, I'm angry with you, chair. Oh, you chair. They do that spontaneously. We tend to project our personality and we personify things. I think they have some kind of abilities. Now, what about animals then? Uh -huh. That's a different thing. Ethological studies of animals and comparing comparative human animal studies have shown that humans and animals, we share a lot more than we have thought before. So the gap is closing. They have a cognitive, emotional, and mental capacity very much like us. Of course, there are differences between different kinds of animals and between individuals, as there are among us. And also evolutionary psychology has shown that we human beings, sometimes of the choices we make, for instance, made choices, whom we marry and so on, is based on our nationality. No, it's a lot on unconscious stimuli that we react to. So you see, the gap is really closing. So we don't always anthropomorphize animals and project onto them and so on, because we are, in fact, very much alike. So these are normal things. But we do anthropomorphize landscapes. This is Norway, of course. You can see the trolls here. And sometimes we see anthropomorphized for very obvious reasons. <laughs> we have several of these in Norway. We have a, I mean, we earn a lot of money on them because tourists come and pay a lot of money to go to Norway to see these fantastic things. Okay, so it's not so strange that we experience nature as animated and full of animated creatures. It's not irrational. It's not the ways of the other, the way other tribes think. We all think so. Also, we so-called modern, uh, industrialized human beings. And we see these things. And we and so on. And today, we even give names to hurricanes. We do, on the news. So it's the same thing, cognitively. This I've said before. And through times, artists have not used this. This is some examples from migration period animal art. This is actually some kind of water bird that see. Lo and behold, we see the same forms in nature. I could have shown you a lot of this, but I couldn't. I couldn't talk the whole day, I'm sorry. This is also more migration period animal art, where you have a mixture and an entanglement of human and animal forms. So you can see various kind of shapes. And I picked up one shape here. Actually, there are several animals here, but lo and behold, it looks like faces, doesn't it? Of course, the face of a person. And a and an animal person. Huh? Do you think they look alike? Yes, yes, I know. And the Viking period, very famous for these things on the, on the ships, scared the ship out of English when they came with the ships with the scary heads. And then I found old dogs. And this is again the same dog. And in medieval period, uh, the Norwegian state churches with these kind of creatures on the tops of the, of the roofs. Creatures that we don't have in reality. We don't have reptiles bigger than this. But still, we have and, and other snakes are also pretty small. And still, you have these birds. And this is a mixture of animal and, and, um, and, and plant, by, plant kind of entanglements. So, and Nicola Astrup, uh, he is, is a painter from the uh, last century. And there's been a big, um, uh, I have to from here, Utstilling, a big show of his paintings that had gone around Europe for two years ago. And he also saw, of course, this tree that looked like it was angry. It has been cut for, for, uh, for making animal feed. So it got this form. And also, he saw a lot of people walking. These are haystacks or, uh, or rain stacks. And in the dusk, it looks like a a procession of people. And this is today, friend, good friend of, of mine. He, he is, uh, after all, a very famous um, chainsaw artist. And he, he sees the poems in nature and does a little extra to it. And then we all see the poems. So he develops what he really sees there and, and takes it more out. So conclusion is a long and yellow one, to attribute life and mental capacities to non-living entities, to plants and natural forces also, to 
personify them and project our own characteristics, motives, and inclinations onto them is simply very normal. It's a basic and typical perception and cognition. So anthropomorphization, animistic thinking, and pareidolia are part of this. It happens automatically and unconsciously, and we can hardly stop it. And we shouldn't, because it's part of our normal way of being. It's a part of being able to identify and perceive potential prey, predators, and other potential dangerous creatures. People, for instance. I mean, to walk, if you live as a mesolithic person, or paleolithic person, to see another human being was not necessarily seeing a friend. It could be an animal, but the sooner you spotted them, then you could do things to say hello or to hide. So the adaptive value is paramount. And anthropomorphization is a basic cognitive ability. Thank you for your time and attention.